Cloud adoption is ramping up, but prevention-based security isn't enough for the hybrid attack surface. That's why Gartner predicts that 60% of enterprise security budgets will go towards detection and response in 2020. ExtraHop Reveal X Cloud delivers cloud-native network detection and response for the hybrid enterprise, the only SaaS-based NDR solution for AWS. Request a 30-day free trial of Reveal X Cloud at extrahop.com forward slash trial. That's extrahop.com forward slash trial. Keep your company and products relevant, competitive, and reliable by standardizing your security framework to protect intellectual property, become a reliable business partner, and guard financial and customer information. Standards Connect is an online standards management solution from ANSI. It's standards access simplified. Standards Connect is a cost-saving, fully customizable solution for entrepreneurs and companies that spend $2,000 or more per year on standards and want to translate spend into a subscription model, want to simplify access, search, monitoring, and collaboration or need a centralized hub of standards for multiple users at one or more locations. Get a free trial at securityweekly.com forward slash ANSI. That's forward slash A-N-S-I. Welcome back to Business Security Weekly. I am your host, Matt Alderman, joined by Paul Asadorian and Jason Albuquerque. Join us at InfoSec World 2020, March 30th to April 1st, 2020, at the Disney Contemporary Resort. Security Weekly listeners save 15% off the InfoSec World Main Conference or World Pass. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ISW2020 and click the register button to register with our discount code. Also mark your calendars for our Security Weekly holiday extravaganza. This Thursday, December 19th, Security Weekly will be live streaming six one-hour panel discussions with some of the most knowledgeable professionals in the industry. To round out the evening, Ed SCOTUS will be joining the Security Weekly hosts to give his annual announcement about the CounterHack Holiday Hack Challenge. You can view the live stream on our YouTube channel or by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash live. We hope to see you there. There will be lots of drinking, smoking, and lots of fun. Yeah, that that Which was is, a change that happened uh, midstream. So uh, Ed Scotus will come on, and then after that, we're doing another panel on hacker culture uh, for a couple of reasons. One, the hosts are kind of rotating into various panels throughout the day. So you'll see different hosts on all of the different uh, panels and different guests as well, right? The other reason is... I had kind of done some research on security history, which also overlapped with hacker culture and chose that for the topic where at the end of the uh, night, 8.30 to 10 p.m., we're doing a roundtable with all Security Weekly hosts, mm -hmm. hopefully some also special guests. Hope we can get everyone seated around the table without too much mic sharing going on <laughs> um, and uh, talk about hacker culture, which I think is something we sometimes lose sight of, yeah. uh, you know, the security industry right. and the security professionals and how we still, need, I believe, need to maintain that hacker spirit, right? in certain aspects yeah, yeah i'm so. looking forward to it and hopefully we can all still talk <laughs> yeah and <laughs> intelligibly <laughs> right <laughs> the key to that day is going to be pacing uh, yourself and yes. i'm serious when a i say yes. i don't mean like the, pacing i don't mean water. the fake like when i say i'm going to pace myself and then i go to schmoocon or derbycon <laughs> or defcon and that goes like right out the window i mean I'm, we're actually have to pace ourselves <clears throat> miss planes mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> well, and we're and, and, and we're having. I paced myself just in. right. <laughs> right. Yeah. Perfectly to sleep. To pass out at the ride. end of the night and not wake up <laughs> till later that no. morning. Whoops. It's beautiful yeah. planning. We're, we're bringing food in a couple times, so we yes. can kind of do lunch and then dinner, and See, so there'll be food. Bad and, pacing yeah. yourself is if you pass out at dinner. <laughs> True. <laughs> True indeed. <laughs> uh, kind of like me at, at Frankie's Tiki Bar right after yes. dinner. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> all right, let's get into these articles. Uh, so the first article I have listed is why crowdsourcing is uh, a bad idea or, or leads to bad ideas. I thought that was interesting. We talk a lot about innovation. Um, I've never used crowdsourcing for innovation. I mean, I guess yeah. you could consider our listener survey crowdsourcing in some respects, right? But, you know, we take those results and try to identify <laughs> where we want to make tweaks to the program. I in don't the, just blindly we, uh, adopt In that. the corporate world, we call that demand. We, <laughs> well, we I, listen to the demand. There's a difference between crowdsourcing <laughs> and crowdfunding, right? Yes. Oh, I see. So Crowdsourcing is collecting of information. It's just the collecting of ideas, yes, whereas yes. Uh, the funding is actually asking yeah. for money yeah. for it. Yes. Sorry, I read that, yeah. that the, title the, wrong as crowd. Funding, which can often lead to bad ideas or no ideas coming to market, but right, that's right. a different thing than 
Well, yeah. I mean, crowdsourcing is, I mean. Well, I mean, it's like that whole mentality of, of trying to make a decision by committee, right? I mean, you know, in, in, in an organization I've been, you always try to take the stakeholders and wean them down. Because when you're trying to make decisions with this massive committee, um, you never get anything done right. because everybody has their own well, ideas and they're always pushing their own agendas. And, you know, right. in, in theory, this is great. But, you know, the article goes into why it can be hard in practice. Yeah, like what's the gist of the, the article in this so, so, lens? So, yeah, you know, the view that I took of this article is, listen, if you're going to do crowdsourcing, try to hone in on, on the right types of folks that you're pulling information from, right? And they go through yes. kind of the psychology of folks who respond to these. And, you know, you have the, the people who have intrinsic motivations where they love to solve problems. Um, you have folks who have that learning motivation because they want to learn new things. You have the socially motivated folks who, you know, want to make a positive impact. Um, you know, and, and, and you have those extrinsic folks who, who want... You know, they want to win. They want to be recognized. They want to win the prize. And, and basically it says, listen, if you can focus, they did a study and it showed you get less innovation and accomplished um, projects by, by pulling that information from the folks who are more learners and social because it's that, it's that logical mind versus emotional heart, right? Mm -hmm. They're making decisions on the emotional heart versus the logical mind where you have the intrinsic folks and the extrinsic folks who are taking more lo a logical approach to it and they're, they're finding there's more success when you, when you start listening to the folks yeah. on that side. Also, I think there's an element of the vocal minority. Sure. Right? Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. 100%. Right? So, so they really, they, they, they honed it down to start, uh, you know, they surveyed folks and they started pulling ideas and, and they found that the most successful innovation projects comes from the folks who, you know, love to, to solve problems and or they, they want that motivation of being recognized mm -hmm. or the prize because they're putting more time into the detail versus the emotion. Mm -hmm. Right. And so what they're talking about is if you're going to do this, kind of focus it on those logical folks that are going to give you really good ideas right. and you're not going to end up with a bunch of garbage or bad ideas mm -hmm. that really don't really drive innovation. They're, they're, they, they're just noise in, in the cycle. Right. Right. And they, you know, they say, how, how do you do that? Right. And, and highlight the, the questions or highlight how you're probing, probing people or, or sur surveying people about, you know, highlight the, 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 the problem at hand or, or the joy of solving the problem or the fact that they'll, you know, you could do some kind of a, like a bug bounty. Think of it like that way, right? You get yeah. some kind of a financial benefit from it. But yeah, the, the best, most successful bug bounties are able to focus mm -hmm. the attention of people in various ways yeah. and different aspects of what you want them to test and compensation, mm -hmm. right? And right, then right. in that light, it, it can also lead to, uh, well, not necessarily bad ideas in that case, right? But lead to you paying out bounties that you really need to pay out because you could have found that stuff yourself for a lot cheaper. Right, or, right, right, you know, right. it, it could lead to people just focusing on the completely wrong areas or not paying attention to any of your stuff because the payout is too low. Right. Right. Yeah, I mean, we, so we reviewed GitLab's payouts, which was just over half a million dollars or like $565,000. But it was 500 research submissions only 171 got paid right mm. so there's a third and then each one averaged like 3300 bucks right so look it, i mean there are ways to you know create bug bounty programs that are really effective but the though that's not also the right mechanism in some yeah. respects either because if you think about it from the researcher side an average of 3300 bucks a payout that, that i mean that, that's not a lot of money, yeah. right? So I don't see the the incentive there necessarily, and I, I don't know how these these crowdsourcing um, projects would would make it incentivized enough to mm -hmm. actually get really good ideas. So that's why I thought the article was interesting. Yeah, yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, just just be careful when you're doing these surveys about you know that that decision by committee, you know, because you're having hundreds and or thousands of people, you know, give their opinions, and and, and really you want you, you want to take action on things that add value to the organization. Mm -hmm. Right, right. It could be literally tens of thousands. Tens of thousands, yeah, absolutely. Right, yep. yeah, not more. Uh, the second article talks about cloud tra transformation. I mean, yeah, we still talk cloud, but, I, you know, this was an interesting article. It kind of gave some steps on how to prepare for this cloud transformation. Um, in, in so, Jason, I'm curious how much of this resonates with you, um, knowing that you're going through aspects of, of yeah. this transformation. Did, did these, I think it's eight steps in here, did these align to some of the things you're thinking about as well? Yeah, I mean, some of them did align, right? I mean, I, I, thinking about a transition to a cloud in 
the parochial old IT ways, like the tower mentality, um, that definitely has to disappear, right? That that's something that I definitely took back and said, the yeah. tower mentality. The, the tower mentality, like based on you have your data center folks or your networking folks or your application <clears throat> folks, and, and taking more of that collaborative approach when when you're looking at migrating to the cloud, because you have to have all of those stakeholders together to make make a good decision, right? And I get feedback. I completely from, agree, one hundred percent, because. What we've realized, um, you know, more recently in becoming very entrenched in is there's lots of different ways to move lots of different things mm -hmm. to the cloud. Yeah. And like Jason said, involves all three or four different Absolutely. subgroups within <coughs> IT mm -hmm. that you got to have those meetings where maybe everyone doesn't agree 100 percent, but everyone walks away with a direction. And this is yeah. where we're going to go. 100%. And I think uh, when, especially when we're talking about moving anything to the cloud in any capacity, there's always going to be, well, like what we're dealing with right now is a lot of unknowns. Like if we do take this one service, let's say, and move it to the cloud, and then there's three or four services that support it, and we use the cloud for all three or four of those services, like we know as IT practitioners, mm -hmm. there's going to be good and bad and some trials and tribulations, yeah, right? Absolutely. And so we're skeptical, but I think it's important to get everyone on the same page yeah. and drive in that direction. And I tell you what, Having done the um, probably the world's slowest cloud migration in a, in a lot of senses, um, it, it's really hard to know and to execute on what do I want to live in the cloud and how. And that's really it's Agreed. not I, the question isn't today like if it's it's like how and what's my what's sure. my time frame. And Marston and I've been designing how we just get our small application in the cloud. Yeah. Yeah. You could host everything right. and rely on the cloud for everything or do it in pieces. And what's yeah. the migration plan? Yeah, and so. a piece of this was, you know, just to, to make sure you have that cloud management readiness posture was, you know, make sure you form a cloud team, right? And I look at it, it's got to be diverse. That team has to be diverse. So, so that way you're making good strategic decisions in, in a collaborative environment where you have that diverse talent pool from a networking side, a data center side, an application side, a security right. side, and you're making good decisions collaboratively. Because I think that the strategy now is in major areas right there's SaaS, and mm -hmm. then there's infrastructure yep and then there's like this mixture of services and applications that you yeah. can host pieces of right and matt i think this all ties back to your great matrix on so you're moving to the cloud what is that what does that mean right mm -hmm. you can host everything on premise or you can host everything serverless mm -hmm. in, in a cloud hosting provider across maybe three cloud hosting providers and everything in between right and, and how do we make those decisions yeah yeah and and I think more importantly in in that first one about a dedicated team, who's responsible? Mm -hmm. See, I think one of the big challenges most organizations have is they have the strategy to move to the cloud, but who owns it? Who owns what right. pieces? Yeah. Do I own the infrastructure pieces? Do I own the application pieces? Mm -hmm. it, there's a lot of things that have to be done. And so your discussion about having a diverse team is important, but you also have to assign some ownership. ownership. Yep. Yeah. around those Absolutely. pieces Absolutely. and that because ownership otherwise might change yeah i mean because it's easy when we look at it right marston and i and i'm like conceivably marston and i can own the whole thing right sure. <laughs> Down yeah, yeah, yeah. to the security groups and the role-based access control to dns is that how is that hosted in the cloud all the way through the application stack right but in larger organizations when you're talking about tens of thousands of people thousands of applications mm -hmm. in different forms who like matt you said like who owns who owns what? Because the requirements are going to change when you go from application to, <clears throat> to application, right? Yeah. DNS is one that we were just looking at the other day. Yeah. As you get more apps in the cloud, your that whole strategy changes. There'll be some area of research that we'll have to focus on. But, yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, one of the points in the article as part of this uh, cloud management readiness is is have proper governance, right? Institute yeah. a proper governance plan. Who's accountable yeah. for what? Who's responsible for what? Right? Who's going to be engaged in what projects? Mm -hmm. So you have that out of the gate. You have that accountability matrix, right? Right. And then the last piece they brought into this, which is the interesting one, is is all around financial operations, yeah. right? I think one of the big things that most people don't realize is, you know, everybody says they want to move to cloud because it's more cost effective. Cloud can actually cost you more if you don't manage Absolutely. those resources correctly. 100%. So, yeah, so you've got this this whole financial operational piece at the end to say, look, 
somebody's got to control your cloud spend mm-hmm. here based on your strategy and how you're rolling this stuff out yeah. because it could cost you more than a dedicated data center if you don't watch yourself. 100%. You have to take a look at the, the pricing models, the utilization models, the, the, the forecasting of, of you know, where you're going to be you know, two or three years from now so you don't get, you don't get stuck in this, in this type of spending that's yeah. always going up. Well, um, Matt, have, looking you at were, the finances, he's huge. Were you there when we were talking about Outpost? No. Amazon, uh, is it Amazon Outpost? Is that right? We can host AWS infrastructure locally for development. Oh, I was no. like, Sounds like a great idea. <laughs> and then you look into it, it's like you have to actually host uh, right. physical infrastructure. And the lowest price that I saw when I quickly started looking at the prices was seven grand a month. Now, for large organizations, that may make perfect sense, right, but right. not every organization it's- is going to be like, for our testing environment, it's... A continued subscription cost of a starting price of seven grand a month. Mm. And I guarantee you that is not in your budget. No. <laughs> we threw that out the window even before we brought it to you, Matt. <laughs> We're like, nope, not even bringing that one to the table. <laughs> but no, I mean, the moral of that story is make sure you have somebody looking at it, right? Looking at the utilization, looking at optimization. Yeah, don't get too far down the design path before <laughs> yeah, yeah. you bring to people, like, right. what's this going to cost kind of thing. How, how make about sure you do sense. some of that analysis before you actually put pen to paper yeah. and sign a contract, yeah. right? Start looking at what that, that future cost would be. The other piece that I pulled out of this, Matt and Paul, was have there was form a cloud concierge. And when I read this, I was like, wait a minute, what are they talking about? But for me, it's like a cloud program manager. Somebody that goes out to the business, interfaces with the business unit, and starts talking about their strategies within that department and how you can help migrate them to the cloud, right? So being strategic across the business so you don't get that shadow IT, right? So that's, that's kind of where I saw that. The cloud concierge more equivalent to like a program manager or something like that. Yeah, and that person, ideally, you have someone on staff, uh, likely mm-hmm. a consultant, uh, that understands all of the cloud services, yeah. what they are, mm-hmm. what they can offer, the differences between the three major platforms right. in those services, and can help you form a decision. If not, your team, like our team, is spending a lot of time researching all those services, sure. and then being able to foster relationships, right? Have that concierge. I'd love to have this person. Yeah, right? absolutely. Go... Well, this other large company is using it for X, Y, Z. You know, let's see if we can talk to them and see what their mileage yeah. is. Because you see all these cloud services, and you're like, that sounds great. And does it really? Does it, it really work? Is our use case really the best usage yeah. of that yeah. of that service? Right, man. We were talking about Lambda. And we're like, is it really the best service for our application? Right. And you got to talk to people and have that concierge to, yeah. to know that. Yeah, and I mean that that concierge and the the you know that financial strategist could be the same yeah. role, right? Mm-hmm. They're going out there, they're looking at the strategy for the business units, but they're also doing that um, they're doing that financial analysis of how much it's going to cost the organization over time. At least you hope so. Hope so, yeah. That's Nirvana. Yeah. <laughs> Those people aren't cheap. They were largely... Uh, oh, yeah. Oh, and hey, by, the, hey by the way, throw the skills gap out there. <laughs> Try well, to find that person. Because <laughs> the, there's only so many people that have that level of knowledge and experience, right? And so I can tell you right now, there a couple of years ago, it was like $400 an hour to get someone to help yeah. you design your app in the cloud. And that yeah. was like... Might have even been a friends and family race. So. Right. <laughs> be all prepared. those skills, the, all those skills are sitting within AWS teams, right? Yeah. And so nobody's going to let those guys right. go. Yeah, they're, exactly. Yeah, I mean they're they're yeah. Uh, a couple communications articles in here. The first one is: Do you need charisma to be a great public speaker? Uh, this was a really interesting article because a lot of people think it's all about charisma. I don't right. have charisma. I'm boring as anybody else. Uh, what this article talks about is presence. Yeah. Uh, it's more about presence, not about charisma. It's providing value to the audience on the topic and, and your passion about how you, you get that message across. I thought it was a really interesting article because a lot of people would say, I don't have charisma, so I'm not going to be a good public speaker, but you don't need it. Yeah, no, I love this article. And, and to be honest with you, you look at a lot, a lot of folks in, in, in the technology and engineering space, and they have that stigma where they're like, I can't be a public speaker. I'm an introvert, right? And they have that kind of weight on their shoulders thinking they can't do it. But, you know, this brought out a, a really good light that it's really about focusing on the audience versus everybody focusing on you, right? How are you adding value back to the audience? And there was a quote in there by, by Nancy Duart, and it says, you may well be the smartest person in the room, Never view a presentation as a chance to show how brilliant you are. You want the audience leaving 
saying, wow, spending time with that presentation was a gift. So, yeah. uh, she does a lot of training on this. I've actually yeah. taken course. Oh, I've have taken you? a class from her. Yeah. That's awesome. So she actually goes out and trains speakers. So she's one of the many speaker trainings that I've gone through through the years. So I love the quote because I've, I've actually awesome. met her. Yeah. 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 So there have been instructors in the past that have given me tips that often overlap with speaker training. I think many of them probably taken the same speaker training, Matt, right? And one thing that they always told me, I won't name names because it's kind of like a cheat, right? If you get to a part in your material or in your presentation where you're not quite sure how to present it, you know, maybe you're still struggling with the slide or you're presenting someone else's slides, they said, just be excited about the material. Yeah. Like, that's fine. Just, sure you, sure it, it doesn't matter. Like, everything else almost doesn't matter in that one moment to get by certain parts of your presentation mm -hmm. or training. Just be super excited about the material and you'll be fine. Your scores will be good, <laughs> right? Now that only takes you through like, my assessment of that was that only takes you through maybe certain parts or pieces of yeah. your presentation and or training that are just really difficult ones sure. to get through. Maybe for you at that time and maybe you develop different methods for that. But the standing thing is you gotta be excited about yeah. your material yeah. all the times, maybe more excited about some of those parts where really boring yeah. or parts that you're still trying to work through. It's funny that you mentioned that because the next article we're going to hit has it highlights that huh? a little yeah, bit. Exactly like right. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. But, yeah, but yeah, that's this article I here, that. I mean, you know, they, they actually go through different ways you can cultivate presence through preparation, practice, um, even stuff you can do before, you know, you, you get up and speak. So it, it was good. It was a lot of a lot of good little nuggets here that I took out of it. Yeah. And, and that ties into the second article on communication, which is, you know, four steps to help, mm -hmm. you know, get clarity in, in get your point across in any presentation, right? This comes from a, a physicist who, who's, who's teaching students. He did yeah. a Ted talk. So Quantum if you physics link... to kids was, and yes. that's what caught my attention. The on Ted this talk article. was awesome, by the way. Yeah. The Ted talk was awesome. Quantum <laughs> physics to kids. I, I can't, and having reading some articles recently about quantum computing and quantum mm -hmm. physics, my head just dizzying. Uh, <laughs> and then reading articles about uh, resistance and conductance, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> this, which yeah. is a physics thing. Oh, I actually learned from watching the TED Talk. I learned about yeah. particle wave duality and quantum tunneling and superpositioning. Right. And yeah. so, but that, I mean, to take those <laughs> super technical topics and break yeah, that break down, down is, I mean, that's largely what we aim to do mm -hmm. a lot of times when we present exactly. or teach, right? Exactly. And so he came up with, it, so first of all, you go to the article, the TED Talk's linked in there. So if anybody wants to watch it, uh, recommend it. Jason, I got a kick out of it. Yeah. Uh, but the second thing is, you know, he, he, he just four simple steps on, how do you take complex topics and, you know, get them to any audience, even kids, right? And again, these two articles tied together, which is why I brought them in here together, is, you know, the first one is, you know, meeting your audience where they're at, right? You have to understand yeah. your audience. You have to understand the level of your audience mm -hmm. because you have to know how deep or how high level you need to be with your audience based on the topic you're presenting and and, and their familiarity with that topic. So, you know, I, I do a lot when I was doing keynotes at Tenable, the different RSA conferences, you know, I spent a lot of time understanding the audience, not only uh, the level of the audience, but even the cultural aspects. I mean, when yeah. you're presenting overseas, there's also a bunch of cultural mm -hmm. aspects you have to Absolutely. take into and, account and as to well. to me, that's like step zero when you're preparing a talk. That's the first thing I ask. When, when, when someone asks me to speak or be on a panel, the first thing I ask is, who's the audience? Got it. And if they can understand. send me an audience right. list with the company and their roles, I, I take it. Uh, I would change the order order of this, right? I would say that first step is knowing your audience, right? To me, that second step in the presentation, once you understand your audience, I like to explain why you're so passionate about the topic first. Mm. Me and yeah. I, from what I've learned from uh, others who are really good at this, mm -hmm. right? Um, cause I'm a nerd at heart. So I have, to, I have to hack and learn about how to present, um, is it, when I'm explaining why I'm so passionate about the topic to put that in the form of a story, that's typically the first thing yeah. I'll lead in with, with the presentation. And that accomplishes things that other professional speaking coaches have said is to capture audiences attention from the very, very first thing that you mm. say. Right. And I didn't even take that a step further and I start with something fairly outlandish and turn that into a story which talks about why I'm so passionate about the topic. Now, I don't always get all those elements together and get it right, especially the first time, which my Matt's advice on practicing <laughs> is important, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> but if you can do that in your the first part of your presentation, that's something that I've kind of hacked together from, yeah. from this advice. Matt, your, your thoughts on that? 
Yeah, I mean, you've got to hook them in that first 30 seconds, mm-hmm. right? You've got to capture their attention. So you you need to get that big idea, What, however you tell it, right? Stories are usually one of the best ways to tell that. But you have to hook that audience in that first 30 seconds when you get there because then they'll pay attention. Otherwise, they're off on their phones, right? And so you've got to get that hook. Uh, and, and passion is part of that. The storytelling is part of that and getting that big idea out. Then these other two points really start to play in. You know, don't lose the plot, yeah. right? You can't go off on tangents. You've you got to, to stay on. Right. You've mm. got to have this this whole plot play out. You've, it, it's a story from beginning to end. You want to start high, you want to end high, and there's variation in that story all the way through. And so you've got to stay on plot. Otherwise, again, you'll lose the audience. And, 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 then, and a, a lot of uh, folks in InfoSec have been doing stand-up comedy, and that first part I, I kind of borrowed or stole from stand-up comedy, right? Because you'd hear comedians saying, like, like Seinfeld was great at this too, yeah. right? You, just, you start out with a outlandish notion right like dry cleaners are out to take over the world right (laughs) and then like your story has to come back to that and and hit on that theme but and likely and it depends on how you you work as an individual but you know you kind of work the story to get back to well wait what's my outlandish thing now fortunately for me I have three kids at home, Mm -hmm. so like my source of material is just an endless source of material with those three, right? Like there's all (laughs) kinds of stories that you could start out with outlandish things. And my poor kids, I've I've used them for source material in my presentations a lot because they often provide that story that provides the example that can continue with the plot, um, you know, of your Mm -hmm. presentation. Yeah, the other piece I liked about this too is is go for clarity over accuracy. When you're when you're talking about a very complex um, topic. You know, you don't always get, go down into that that nitty gritty into the weeds about the accuracy. Yeah, so, I mean, the the story that came out of the TED talk was he was, you know, the the physicist was trying to explain superpositioning, right? And basically, it's it, you know, he was he was leveraging stories, and it wasn't one hundred percent accurate, right? It's about the protons spinning both ways at the same time. That's not. 100% accurate, but it gives you the visual of what right. you need you have to, to understand very, the concept. As everyone knows, you have to be very careful sure, with sure. this. In the example you just gave, if he's presenting to a room of physicists... That's why you have to know your oh, audience. Exactly. And that's why that's step bad. zero is so exactly. important, right? Exactly. You do that in front of a room of physicists. Right. If you're talking about yep. uh, exploit development and bumper overflows mm-hmm. to a bunch of pen testers and exploit writers... Oh, like Absolutely. you've got to be a hundred, like you have to lose some of that story mm-hmm. to stay accurate. Otherwise you're going to lose your audience. Oh, 100%. However, however, flip that you're talking to the board and maybe the larger IT team That's it. that are practitioners and they're part of the blue team. Right. Then it is imperative. It's almost more important to be able to lose some of those technical details, still capture you the essence to. of it to maintain your audience. Cause you'll lose, attention. you'll lose the board. Yeah. Right. Exactly. And then potentially lose funding. So again, that's why knowing your <laughs> right? audience is the most it's important. It's huge. Thing. It's yeah. huge. But I, it, so I agree. And I, it, number three for me, depended on your audience, right? Because yes. you can't stand up at a DefCon or a Black Hat 100%. and not go over the. Mm-hmm. And that's oftentimes why some of those talks are are difficult to get through sure. because they have to do that technical accuracy. It's also why they're so largely attended because it mm-hmm. could be the first time they're describing a technique that is super tech. That's what I was just going to say. I mean, you yeah. could be walking in the door with, with you know, seasoned security engineers, but you're talking about quantum computing that they have, they've never seen, they've never mm. experienced, they have no detail right. on. So you have to, you know, you have to be able to know that audience as well. This is, this is a brand new technology that they've never experienced. They don't know. Right. How can I equate this to things they know? And now in a, in a teaching sense too, um, I, I think sometimes just, you know, going out and having a beer with the technical person in your uh, classroom that has, you know, maybe you're talking about a topic and that's been their past year of research Mm -hmm. and or work or more. And you have to tactfully say, like, let's chat afterwards, right? And then go through all those Mm -hmm. little technical things one-on-one with the person. Because if you do that in the audience, it's back to Max's point. You don't want to go off on a tangent. You don't want to let someone in the audience have you go off on a tangent because you glossed over something technical Mm -hmm. and you're like, hey, we'll get back to that, right? So having that dynamic with the audience is really important. Really basically not leaving anyone out in your audience, And and I've seen that in in, in a ton of presentations where, hey, if anybody wants to get into the technical detail on this, come see me after. Exactly. Exactly. Let's talk after. Yeah, exactly right. 
because otherwise you'll lose the rest of your audience yep. and then the, yep. the whole presentation's over. Uh, Paul, I brought this one in for you because um, <laughs> you need a better email tool. So here's the top 20. Lots of email uh, tools. And there's 20 of them in here. Some of them I have tried. Any any that are decent? I mean, we use Zapier, but we use Zapier yeah. very specifically in our business flow uh, with HubSpot and some of the other thing, other tools that we're using to kind of pull data together. Yeah. I don't see HubSpot as a normal email tool for the like the individual user, some of these other ones are probably better individual tools. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're we're using Zapier as well for for integrations, right? Taking a couple of collaboration portals and integrating them together. So yeah, so it's a good I tool. Have, um, it's a good tool. Uh, I think a couple of times I've tried Front. Um, I think it has potential. It and it it says per person per month. It's really more meant for a team, um, and it doesn't. It, at least at the time I looked at it, did not have hooks into everything. What I would still love to see in front was one of the closest things I saw to this were for an organization be able to take in LinkedIn, Twitter, and email, and potentially even comments from something like a YouTube and streamline that into a unified inbox, mm. a team inbox experience yeah. that can generate tickets and prompt people uh, to take action. I see that with specific ecosystems like mm -hmm. you could probably get someone to have that for you for youtube or for facebook is probably a big one because right? yeah. i've definitely seen people who are selling a product and every single person's comment or question has a reply there's definitely technology that is helping them make sure that they've responded uh to everyone right but uh, i think a different kind of take on this is is taking email in the different form like different lists you may have mm -hmm. different things right uh, and all of those other communication mechanisms and helping you streamline that for your organization. Yeah. I haven't seen anything really great. So Front it, was close to that. Miss, yeah, but Missive is supposedly the one. Okay. Uh, it, it's like Hiver in Front, and it allows you to integrate in your social media stuff. So I'm curious. Oh, okay. Yeah. I so you that might, one. there's a free version, so you should try that and see if it, it does that because it'd be interesting if you can integrate those mm. together in a unified way. Right. Even That's if the I closest got, one on this list. Even if I got four out of five, it'd be because uh, I don't expect every, uh, them to support everything like just mm. for me. I have used Postbox on um, Mac OS. That was, that was pretty good. Uh, actually, probably one of the better uh, email clients. And they support Mac OS and Windows now. Uh, so Postbox is, is one of my favorite uh, email clients. On um, Linux... Mailspring is what I'm using now, and that's and that's not bad. Yeah. But I didn't know about some of the add-ons to uh, to Gmail. There was one in here that turns your inbox into a Kanban board, which yes, I like that one. I would try that. I'm not saying that that is a good idea or a bad idea, but I think it has enough merit that that one's I called would, Drag. Yeah, I would totally try that. I love I love visual boards. Yeah, absolutely love it. So Kanban, I, I want to try that one definitely. Um, the other one that, that I was interested in is Crystal. We were just talking about knowing your audience. And basically, oh, yeah, Cr Crystal that. learns about your email recipients and based on their online persona, suggests phrases in, in, in different ways to word your email based on their persona. So know your audience. That could be a good one for sales teams yeah. or it could end horribly. Could. Going back to that technical totally. discussion that totally. you got something slightly wrong and when the exactly. technical person <laughs> yeah. reads it goes... Yeah, but that's, but that's why I'm interested. I how, tell, accurate, how accurate yeah. is it, right? How I can tell the AI generated your email <laughs> yeah, to me, basically, totally. right? Well, that just throws all my templates out the window. Right. So, <laughs> yeah. um, I send so many emails on a given day. I got to have some preset templates. I mean, Crystal would completely mess that yeah. up. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> all right. Last article for the year on Business Security Weekly, upskilling and reskilling strategies. Paul, I think you had some insight potentially on this. Yeah, so it's really interesting. Um, it, and I don't, it, it kind of, the book I'm reading, uh, Hackers, Heroes of the Computer Revolution by Stephen Levy. Great read. Definitely recommend everyone in technology read that book to understand where the hacker culture began and how it presented itself in different scenarios. And one of those points in time in the history of software and computing was some of the first companies that were making games for Things like the Apple II, uh, eventually the IBM PC, and the Atari 800, mm -hmm. uh, which was uh, actually a, com a computer way back in the day. I never had an Atari 800, um, but they talk about the differences between them. That company was originally called Online Systems, and as I'm listening, I'm like, 
that sounds like Sierra online. And then so I'm like, all right, to the Google, as you know, pause the book. I'm listening to you, uh, pull the car over. I'm like, no, that's Sierra online. And I know those from back in the day doing PC gaming mm -hmm. when you used to play there. Remember Leisure Suit Larry? I remember booting up on like an old IBM PC that was running Windows 3.1 and playing a graphical version of, and they talk about the history mm -hmm. uh, of that game very briefly. And it wasn't oh, yeah. called, yeah. it was called Soft Porn. Actually, was the name of the game before it was Leisure Suit Larry, which I never knew. I didn't know that. But then it talks about the crazy couple and the crazy culture that they built uh, in online systems and eventually Sierra Online and the transition and how it plays into hacker culture. Mm -hmm. One of the things they're talking about in the context of this very long story they're telling in the book, it crosses a couple of uh, chapters, um, is uh, how they overcame the skills gap. Because there's only back then, uh, and probably true today, right? So many people who could code in the assembly language for Mac computers in the 80s. <laughs> and <laughs> that instruction set was different from a lot of other assembly language instruction sets, obviously. But you had to know, to make a good game and make the graphics look yeah. like not completely terrible, mm -hmm. you had to know how to code in assembly. So uh, Ken Williams, the founder, uh, and his wife Roberta, the founders of uh, Sierra Online, would take people from all different, like the person that worked at the liquor store ended up with like an operations job and learning mm -hmm. programming. Yeah. Like that, he would hire the person that was like driving the Pepsi truck and stuff. And uh, then his strategy became rather than taking the small pool of talent that were true hackers that like basically one of the uh, programmers was uh, a really young, he was probably 20 in the time of the book that he's talking and even younger when he started, was just an amazing assembly language programmer, right? And just learned it on his own, was amazing. Yeah. Um, he's like, I'm only gonna find so many of those people. So he was taking traditional, uh, books starting to transition into how he, to grow the company, was taking regular programmers, would take them under his wing and teach them the assembly language to yeah. do that. And then when I started reading this article about upskilling and reskilling, I was like, wow, this is not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. This has been going on since right. the beginning of, well, in this case, computer gaming, basically. Yeah. And, and magna cum laude was the best version of Leisure Suit Larry, by the way. It was the college campus. Oh, I don't, I, yeah, there was like eight different, <laughs> yeah. uh, there was like eight different versions. That was like early 2000s with, yeah. that, with that when that dropped. Yeah, and, but there are some great stories about, you know, even if you have someone with the right skills, um, make sure they have the right projects. Yeah. They learned the hard way how um, strict and how um, the various companies like Atari approached the licenses to things like Pac-Man. Mm -hmm. They actually wrote a version of Pac-Man and I think eventually ended up not even selling it or doing anything with it, even though they changed stuff. Um, a lot of those big gaming companies were like, well, we can't write the best games, but since we own this intellectual property, yeah. we've got some of the best lawyers, so we're just going to sue people to make money. <laughs> right. <laughs> Great. Yeah. I mean, so be careful when you're skilling and upskilling and reskilling right. that you uh, have them on things that are not going to get you in trouble with uh, respect to me. And of course, we've come a long way in understanding mm -hmm. a little better about intellectual property, uh, and certainly as it's related to gaming and any of those copyrights on the arcade games. Uh, some of you may have caught our segment uh, with Kevin Finisterra and, and Josh uh, on that. And it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really, it's a very, uh, the opposite of hacker culture <laughs> in those uh, yeah. scenarios. So, yeah, and we, you know, we've talked on some of the other shows about, you know, finding skill sets within the organization mm -hmm. to reskill them, right? Like networking folks yep. that can transition over into security from network operations, security operations, developers moving into application security, right? There, there's a lot of skills within an organization. Mm -hmm. And if you have the right upskilling and reskilling strategies in place, you can start to move people who have interest in security from other roles that have the Absolutely. foundational skill set into these new security right. roles. Yeah. But it's also, rethinking our hiring processes, yeah, right? It's, but it's, it's about, finding the right mindset too. It's you the know? attitude and the aptitude. We've right. said it on this before, on the, on the show before. Attitude and aptitude. Seeing if they have the right uh, problem solving skills, yeah, right? Not necessarily it. the right technical skills mm -hmm. in the area because we can learn those. And it's about understanding who's um, embodying the hacker culture, right? Mm -hmm. So one of the developers for Sierra Online, the way he learned the assembly language was he essentially reverse engineered the Atari 800 assembly language. There was mm -hmm. very little documentation. He would actually call up 
Atari and try and get information out of them, and they would not give him yeah. any information about it and learn that very valuable skill basically on his own yeah. by hacking it, right? And not everyone is going to approach software and some of the things we're talking about today with that same tenacity sure. and in hacker spirit. Mm -hmm. Now, that doesn't mean they can't work in security. It doesn't mean they can't be right. in technology. But the important point is is to know those different personas and mm -hmm. where they fit in your yeah. organization. That if you have someone with that skills, that they, it's a good match to work. Know what, what they're capable of, right? Get someone else who may have a different mindset, different background, maybe mm -hmm. slightly different persona. Maybe they're better in, in this role. And I think it really comes down to good to great knowing what seat they are on the bus. On the bus, right? Right? That's really what Are you the right person to, on the bus? And do, are, you, right? are you sitting in the right seat on the bus, right? Yeah, right. Absolutely. exactly. Absolutely. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. This is our last episode of 2019. I hope everybody has a great holiday season. Happy New Year. See you we'll in the see New you Year. again in 2020. Happy oh, holidays. Weekly.